I want to talk tonight about uh, being, and I want to apply that to our intentions and who we are, who we are being and who we are becoming as we move into the new year. As I enter into this topic, I want to go back to my own roots, and I'm going to date myself here, and talk about a teaching I got when, in the spring of 1975, I did the EST training, created by Werner Erhard, who drew on, as best I know, both science of mind and actually Scientology, uh, in, I think, uh, to pull together a really a powerful, 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 very experiential four-day training. Uh, this is sort of the granddaddy of a lot of human potential workshops. It was very rigorous uh, when I did it initially the very first time, like bathroom breaks were every eight hours or so, like what? And it was a little militaristic. But that said, there was a lot about it that I, I got a lot of value from. Um, some might say, um, I, among them probably, that there was something a little pushy, a little cultic about some of the business practices and the EST organization. But the actual content, the actual content, um, I got a lot of value out of as a young, I think I was 22 at the time, 22-year-old guy. So the key idea that uh, was being presented there that I want to share with you tonight has to do with a... Um, a kind of a typical sequence. So <clears throat> very often in life, we start out by thinking about what we want to have, all right? We want to have more money. We want to have kids who do better in school. We want to have a partner who's really nice to us. Uh, we want to have a greater peace of mind, all right? We want to have that. So I think, well, to have that, you know, or let me put it a little differently. How do I want to put this? Yes, we might say to ourselves, here we go. Here we go. Uh, that, you know, I want to be happier. I want to be wiser. I want to be more awakened. That's what I want to be. Okay. To be that, I need to do various things. I need to meditate. I need to exercise. I need to study the Course of Miracles. I need to do gratitude practices. I need to walk the dog more. I need to eat less pasta. I need to do things in order to be what I want to be. And to be able to do those things, I need to have certain things, all right? I need to have a gym membership. I need to have money in the bank. I need to have a partner, a friend, someone I'm dating who you know can help me feel certain things who can do certain things with me. So you see the, the sequence, you know, I, the end result is being, you know, what do I want to be? I get to that end result of what I want to be through various kinds of doing. And to be able to do those things, I need to have various resources of one kind or another. That's the way that people typically, typically think about that. Um, <clears throat> what they did in the training that kind of blew my mind is after walking people through that, which I've walked you through here, you know, the result is what we want to be achieved through doing various things. Second, which are enabled by what we have. Third, okay. They turned it around and they said, no, that's the conventional way of approaching things. And it's completely backwards. The proper way to approach things is to focus first on the origin of all doing and having, which is our state of being. Are we being mindful already? Are we being virtuous? People who actually take a stand and keep our word. Are we being grateful already? Are we being, uh, as the title of Ajahn Chah's, one of his wonderful books, are we being dharma? Are we being truth? Are we living from truth? Are we rested in truth? That's the fundamental meaning of the word dharma, the truth of things. Uh, are we being accepting of ourselves? Are we being uh, rested in a sense of our inherent worth and value as a fundamentally good person? Uh, what are we being? Or are we being cranky? Are we being anxious? Are we being 
uh, resentful? Are we being mean? Uh, are we being hard on ourselves? Being is the origin point. From being, naturally, flows doing. Uh, as I said, maybe just before we did a, our formal start here, the Buddha rested in being enlightened, as best we can gather, uh, naturally meditated. Meditation, the doing of meditation, flowed naturally from his state of being. So being is the origin point from which doing naturally flows. If you are being rested in love, if you are being love, if you are being lived by love, then naturally you do more kindly speech toward other people. You do more of a sense of restraint of some of our, you know, your, my neurotic reactions to other people. Doing naturally flows from being. And then as we do various things that flow from our foundation, our underlying uh, qualities of being, the underlying container of being that uh, holds is the context of our skillful means, our actions of thought, word, and deed, our doing. From that doing naturally uh, come various results that we get to have. Right? Rested, let's say, in being love, from which flows the doing of wise speech, right speech, right action, right livelihood, from which then we start to have networks of good relationships. We start to have goodwill for us out in the world. We start to have a reputation, you know, at least in some quarters, <laughs> you know, as someone who's pretty okay and not usually a jerk, you know, uh, we start to have those things. Maybe money starts to flow from the actions we take that are grounded in being love, being loving, let's say, or being self-respecting. From that being flows certain doing that maybe set boundaries, uh, may with other people be both loving and clear about boundaries, from which then can flow uh, a kind of a sorting over time in our relationships, uh, ones with others who, let's say relationships with others who um, are good with how we are uh, manifesting the being of self-respect through clarity and occasional assertiveness, and then those who maybe aren't comfortable with that or really can't really rise, uh, can't step into that, they kind of fall away from our life. And over time, we start to have a natural sorting or sifting in our relationships that starts to concentrate more in or have a greater density of people who really treat you well, appropriately. They respect you as you, the manifestation, the result that, that originates in a respect for yourself. This is a very fundamental point here. It might seem a little abstract at first, you know, beginning with being, start by being. I think it's a phrase from Heidegger, I think. Um, being precedes becoming, right? In other words, who are you being already and also, what are some of the qualities of being you'd like to live into or have more established in yourself or establish yourself more in, in the coming year, right? When we look out at the coming year, we might say to ourselves, you know, I really, I'd like to have more money or I'd like to, I'd like to have a vaccination or I'd like to be healthy or, you know, I'd like to have a little more free time or I'd like to have a better relationship with my estranged fill in the blank, you know, ex-brother-in-law. Uh, that's what I like to have. Okay, you know, it's okay to think that way. And then you might think to yourself, well, <clears throat> what would I need to do to have that particular result? Maybe what I need to do, let's say, to have the result of being a little healthier, a little more physically fit. At my advanced age, I'm realizing uh -huh, a lot of different, some, there's some deferred physical exercise that's time now. So I'm doing more of that. So, okay, I want to have the result, got to do these things. But what sense of who you are, of 
who you be, what kind of being you are, what sense of the of being would support the doing, would manifest naturally, would be expressed naturally as the doing that would bring you the result that you'd like to have. See this fundamental idea? And if you want to do, if you want to do, <laughs> so let's say you're being insightful and you're being on your own side and you're being open to learning and trying new things, from that could naturally flow a little, um, I'll show you, like a little piece of paper that maybe you put the being column here, the doing column here, and the have, having, let's say, column there. And just start, if you think about an important area of your life, kind of sort things into the different columns and really, really highlight the being column. What's in that being column that would support the doing that would bring you the having that you'd really like? And I'm going to, um, you know, finish what I'm talking about pretty soon. And then we could do an example or two, if you like. Maybe someone would be willing to kind of walk through be do have with me to kind of illustrate, um, you know, this basic idea. So it's it's important to appreciate, I think, that this idea, crediting Werner, hopefully who credits his own sources, um, that uh, Werner Erhard, that uh, it, it's deceptively simple and really easy to forget. You know, we live in a culture that bombards us with messages all the time that um, in order to be fill in the blank, popular, uh, successful, uh, loved, thin, <laughs> you know, we need to, you know, in order to have that, we got to, in order to be that, right? We have to do various things, and in order to do those things, we have to have certain things, like a membership in a particular gym or a subscription to a particular Instagram account or you know something like that. And we tend to get caught up in the materialism, really, of having, and we lose sight, or we get caught up in the doingness, right, of being. I've spent a lot of time in the doingness of accomplishing one task after another so that someday, always extended out into the future, I could finally be content with myself or be, you know, um, at ease in this life. Never came because the identification with doing kept pushing away the being that I longed for, which may sound familiar perhaps, at least to some of you. And so we live in a culture that tends to hypnotize us or you know, draw us into a focus on having and doing when in fact, the origin of it all, the wellspring of it all is being. Okay. So knowing that I'm gonna get into some, you know, a couple of examples that I think will make this even more concrete, um, uh, I wanna kind of, extend this into some things I've been reflecting on lately in the field of relationships, which is often a, a, a space um, that um, we, uh, you know, is a priority for many of us, including me. Okay. So one thing that I've been reflecting on lately, kind of two things. One is really struck me recently when I was walking with a friend and he said something just innocuous, no big deal. And I said something that I would say came from a place inside that's sort of jokey and kind of glib. Fine, no worries. But then I suddenly realized that the voice in me, the subpersonality, you know, the part of me as a whole, me in the broadest sense, um, ha was able to speak. And much of my speaking came from just a handful of the subpersonalities naturally within me. 
And yet those other subpersonalities, so those, those other voices, those other parts of me, those other feelings or attitudes or perspectives or longings or levels, like younger levels or more primal, really, really deep, deep, deep primal levels that were nonverbal, were not given voice. This is natural. There are many metaphors for the the mind very broadly, the the person very broadly. We we could imagine that there's a round table, if you will, there's a committee of perspectives, attitudes, desires, and so forth, often sometimes struggling with each other. Uh, there's a you know a, a book in the 70s from Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of cybernetics, titled The Society of Mind. It's as if it's a society with different coalitions and and factions, you know, vying with each other for resources and control. Another metaphor of our personness, if we will, as process, is a village. It's like there's a village with, you know, many characters in it, or a zoo, right? <laughs> or a vast domain with many, with many elements in it. And yet only a few of the elements of who we are speak. To others. Isn't that interesting? And that means that when we listen to others, only a few, only a fraction, a minority of the subpersonalities, the facets, we could say facets. Uh, there's a symphony metaphor that Dan Brooke is coming in with, you know, the instruments that they're hearing inside. Only a small, small fraction of all that bubbles out. So much of the time when we're with other people and we're tracking what they're saying, what they're saying is what a part of them is saying, but so many other parts of them are voiceless. And the best we can do is empathically imagine what else might be going on. Different layers or levels, like vulnerable parts underneath the kind of positional critic in them. Uh, maybe, you know, parts that feel hurt or needy underneath parts that are really cool and just sort of, you know, yakking away with us. What else is going on in them? And to realize that much as for us, we're, um, we struggle to express ourselves fully so that we can be fully known. It's a natural process. That means that other people struggle too. Other people struggle too. And, and yet we react to these small parts of other people that are speaking, right? We react to them and often enough, the other parts of that person are like, ugh, at a loss or bemused or they, they feel let down because we don't recognize the whole much as we ourselves feel often that we don't recognize the whole in other people. And my point here, as we go into the new year, perhaps rested in being loving, being love, really, being um, lived by love and wisdom, kind of two central themes. In Buddhist practice, you could argue in all practices, the two together, wisdom and a, and a goodness. Uh, a wisdom that recognizes what's really true, recognizes causes and effects, recognizes things in a fairly in, somewhat impersonal way. It's just, it is the way it is, whether we like it or not, right? Uh, that's wisdom. But it's combined with the coolness, if you will, perhaps of wisdom is combined with the warmth of leaning in, leaning toward, being for, for ourselves and for other beings, the two together. So let's suppose that it is actually our intention as we come into the new year to be lived by wisdom and love, a loving wisdom, a wise love, right? in all its forms. Well, from that intent then, it's really powerful when you're talking with other people 
to appreciate that so much of what they're presenting to you is just a partial fraction of all of what they feel, all of what they think, and all of what they want. And to keep in mind, to not over-conclude uh, from what people say and the way they've learned to communicate and the small fraction of themselves that have, that have the microphone, that have developed a, a shtick, a style. That's just a small part of who that whole person is. And one of the practical takeaways, I think, is to slow it down and to not be too reactive to or and to, to not solidify so much or reduce all of who that other person is into some particular position or some particular voice. And as well, we can try to be aware of the all of who we are, all the facets, all the per subpersonalities, all the <laughs> characters around the table in the committee, all the characters in the village, pick your metaphor. Um, we can try to be you know, more sensitive to and aware of all of those within ourselves. We can bring wisdom and love to ourselves, to our own interior, much as we want to express it to what is exterior to us. We can do that, and we can try to be a little more thoughtful about or more mindful of or more courageous about you know, giving voice to or acknowledging more of the parts of the whole that we are. The other thing I just want to mention in, in passing in my way into opening it up to um, <clears throat> a question or two about a particular be, do, have you know, example uh, recently, I had a really interesting experience, which is that I, um, I don't spare you some of the details to protect the innocent and the guilty, but um, I was introducing a friend of mine to two people I know reasonably well. I introduced my friend to them for his own purposes, having to do with something he wanted to, you know, if possible, consult with them about and be helped by them about with probably an exchange of money involved in a very you know reasonable and clean way. So I introduced my friend to these people through email and I did so in a in quite a personal way. Uh, you know, I connected with them. I, I said a little bit about how I was doing these days. I I wished these these two people, you know, well and I also acknowledged them really quite highly uh, and explained why I was connecting my friend with them. That was the introduction. What came back from each of these two people was an email that copied me on it, but didn't address me at all, didn't speak at all to what I'd shared about how my life was going these days and my warm wishes for them and my really high esteem and acknowledgement of them uh, you know, for my friend. It's as if it never happened. It just didn't exist. And what they did is they just spoke appropriately in this email having to do with the particulars of the situation to my friend, leaving without any communication to me personally. And it was, as the Buddha would call it, I think, a first start for me as a social mammal, a social primate who understandably wants to feel like he, me, exists for other people. So when there's a natural opportunity to acknowledge the existence, in this case of me, and, and the, the very warm and respectful and acknowledging and quite personal way I you know, reached out to them, when there's an absence of that recognition of just simply the existingness you know, of a person, it's kind of jolting. And if the relationship is highly significant, which for me, it, it's not highly significant with these people, but it's, you know, these are people I respect and I know they're in some ways peers of mine. Um, you know, it really lands. And one way to appreciate how much it's important to us uh, to feel that we actually exist in the minds of other people is shown in what are called the still face research studies of toddlers, you know, six month olds who can sit up in a high chair, 12 month olds sometimes older kids, what they'll do is they'll plant a parent 
in front of the, the I'll call it an infant. And what the parent is uh, instructed to do is just sit there with a stone, with a poker face, a stone face, no matter what the kid does. And uh, they will usually halt the experiment within seconds, certainly within half a minute, because the kids freak out so much. Their parent, no matter what the kid does, the parent just stares at them as if the kid doesn't exist. And that is so jolting. It's so disorienting, especially at a primal level for a young, vulnerable, dependent child, that it's just, it really undoes them. And, you know, as adults, maybe we're more layered, we're more regulated, you know, we're more defended, we can handle a little better. Um, but it still really gets to us. And in, and this episode for myself, which I'm on the other side of, it's, it's really okay, uh, uh, was very instructive. I was startled by how much I was affected by it. And I reflected on the longing in people, just inherently, not just people, like I'm very, fairly well practiced at this point, kind of introverted, you know, I have good friends. I'm not, you know, it's not like these are high stakes relationships with these two people, but still I was, I was wounded. I was rattled. I was like, I was miffed. I was angered. Like what? I was hurt and angry. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, on the other side of those reactions, but they were teachers for me. And the takeaway from all this, and the reason I'm telling this story in some detail so you can kind of relate to it, is as we enter into this new year, if it is important to you as one of your goals to begin with being wise, you know, to begin with being love in the broadest sense, uh, including a love that is willing to set boundaries and assert itself, as you uh, enter this year, and I'm really taking it into account myself, it's really important to appreciate that just about everyone wants to be seen. They want to feel seen. Just about everyone wants to be forgiven. Just about everyone wants to be loved. Just about everyone wants to be appreciated, wants to be recognized, including in particular ways for their own particular strengths or contributions, virtues, qualities. Seen, forgiven, loved, or just simply liked or respected or, you know, compassionated and appreciated for what is good about them, for the contributions they're making and their own special qualities. So finishing here, and I'll open it up for an example or two, um, you might take on board, if you like, moving into the new year as an expression, a natural expression of wisdom and love, being wise, being loved, a natural expression is to keep remembering, you know, keep coming back home to the recognition that people around you, you know, most people do want to feel seen and forgiven and loved and appreciated. And if more people <laughs> would do that, wouldn't the world? be a kinder, gentler, easier, more just, more equitable, better place. Okay. So, lots of comments coming in through the chat. You're welcome to look at them. Uh, remembering that when you use the chat, I highly encourage you to use it for your own practice. Focus on what your own growing edge is, your own learning is, and what would support that, and your own growing into and more stabilizing who you want to be. Use it for that purpose uh, and rather than advising or, or criticizing other people. Uh, just And I say this generically. I'm not picking up on any particular comment that I'm seeing in the chat. I'm just kind of reminding everyone. All right. Is there anyone who would like to talk through this be-do-have model in a fairly 
brisk way. Uh, you know, knowing that you're revealing yourself to 469 people, me included. Okay, anybody want to talk through an example? You could raise your hand, you push the raised hand feature, or I'll just see you wave your hand, uh, and then you can, I think, unmute yourself. Anybody want to bring up an example? I see Orly Guzzi, am I mispronouncing? I'm probably mispronouncing your name. So that was the first hand I saw. Where are you, Orly? Can you unmute yourself? I see participants raising their hand, yay. Okay, Tom has told me that if I go to the participants list, can I go to the top, Tom, and find people who've raised their hand? Yep, scroll to the top. Okay, so I'm gonna, I see several, oh, okay, I see quite a few people. I'm gonna have to make a call here, um, but I'm assuming I'm seeing all the raised hands at the top of the stack, great. Um, I'm gonna do, start with Farah Masumi. Okay, Farah, so I'm gonna, can you uh, unmute yourself, Farah? Hi, Dr. Hansen. I Hello. really wanna appreciate you are amazing and oh. all of those Wednesday gift that you give it to us has impacted me so much and I introduce oh. you to so many people around me. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I, well, wait, wait. I wanna see you acknowledging me. So <laughs> you can see that I see you seeing me seeing you, okay? I appreciate it. And it's really an interesting point, how often we just move right past, you know, the little moments, like speed bumps. No, slow down for the speed bumps, you know, interactively. Okay, good. I'm saying that to everybody, not, not just you. Okay, great. Oh yeah, so what's your situation? Uh, and however you wanna talk about it, what would you like to have? And then we can work backwards to the being that would support that, or maybe just talk through a situation. So my, my goal for this new year, yeah. I'm a giver, but I have a hard time receive. Mm -hmm. And with I... my husband's situation, which is uh, in that uh, have a cancer and Parkinson, mm -hmm. it is uh, time for us to shift that also accept other people's help as well. Um, okay. What I noticed in myself uh, is it's one, It's about the being part, right? I'm 100% with you. Yep. Is uh, in that part, I notice uh, I feel a lot of guilt and shame mm -hmm. when I wanted to accept either love, support, you know, whatever. Yeah. Because that is out of my ordinary practice. My baseline is to uh, just, give freely with and feel guilty when I receive it. Yeah. So I let's... know this guilt is a lot part of the culture. I'm Iranian mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, really raised with a lot of guilt. Okay. And uh, I don't know how much really yeah. I can pass through it. Okay. So thank you for giving up your body for science here. <laughs> so, and uh, only be as personal as you want to be, and I'll kind of dive in and we'll work it out. So let, let me just say back to you what I'm hearing. So let's say that you want to have more help from other people, and you want to, let's say, have uh, more receptivity to that help. Let's say you'd like to have that, okay? Is right. That correct? I what I also see is I have it. All right. And I yeah. But what I'm not practicing mm -hmm. is being into that receptive mode. Okay, great. Well, then we're just you're you're ahead of me. They're great. Okay. So you want to have that. Okay, good. But and and you could say you want to do a natural interaction with other people where you're receptive. You know, and you're relaxed about that, and you don't have to hem and haw to make, cover your your guilt or shame, or you know, placate other people, or somehow make you know over earn the support that you've already way earned. All right, it's an important point. You've already earned it. Okay, so to be it, so you want to be more comfortable and be less shamed and be more rested in a sense of worth. That's really great. So you've, that's really great. So you already have identified that. You're, you are 
you're already through my process. So how can you then be more rested in a feeling of all rightness in receiving help and support and giving to you from other people, right? And um, so I can just suggest a couple of things that ring really true for me about that. One is you can be clear about the justice of receiving, the fairness, the ethics of it, the fact that others have the right to receive, you too have that right. That right is not withheld from you. And there's an aspect of this that's a little conceptual, like where you just, you, but it's really about clarity. You, you be clear that it's fair. It's fair. And you, you really hold on to that sense of justice, that sense of principle, right? So that's one thing that really helps here. A second is you could be, um, how can I put it, also really clear that for other people to have the benefit of giving, you must participate in the receiving. So you could be clear that it is a gift to them to receive from them. So it's beyond the logic part. In oh, the I logical, I know it. In the logical part. Yeah, but you don't uh, believe it. But it still cannot pass through the guilt and shame. And that's what I wanted to ask you. How is that related to the trauma? Is that people stuck with the trauma in the past or some part of the trauma, some of those uh, being that right. you talk yeah. about. Yeah, so I'm a long time, are you a therapist too? I'm a long time therapist. Yes, I'm yeah. a therapist. So you, get, you really get this, but I wanna push on this point really for other people. Cause there's often this, what people watched us do is quite common. And my point about it is that there is a step that a person can take where they, they fight for their own conviction, right? People know things, but they don't believe them. And that's something a person can do. They can say, no, 1% of me knows this is true. 99% of me is arguing against it, but 1% of me knows this is true. And I'm gonna really fight for that knowing. There's, that's really an important point. I, I just wanna say that. Okay, having said that, um, gosh, another thing, that really comes out for me around this particular issue, uh, you know, which I've had my own version of as a man, you know, in my own ways, not like everybody has it, but I've had my own version of it, is to, how can I put it? It's to be in touch with a sense of your own inherent goodness. It's to feel it. You know, is to feel, is to let it sink in again and again. Like I, I bet far, you know, just from your account, what you've given to others is this big. Your sense of your own worth is this big, right? And that's often the case for many people. And, you know, it's discrepant. If a person has more of a feeling of their own, they've given so much. You've been so generous already, right? Um, and to be really clear, if the guilt arises or the shame arises, it's over here. Where do you take your stand? Where do you rest in refuge? What do you stay in touch with? Do you stay in touch with the feeling of your own sweetness? You're such a good girl already. I know obviously you're a mature, accomplished woman, but deep down, you're, you're such a good girl already. You don't need to earn it anymore. You're already a good girl. You're already a good person. You're already a phenomenal wife. All the things you've done for your husband. And it's to feel this, it's to, it's to feel it. Yes, you know it, it's to feel it. It's to feel your goodness. You know, much as you would wish another person. Uh, 
I bet you're a really wonderful therapist. I can feel already some of your qualities just kind of quickly here. You know, imagine how you would be with your client or your friend, your friend who is struggling to let it in that, no, they've, they've already won the war. They've already done the job. They've made it, right? We don't have to prove anymore. We don't have to keep trying to fill an empty bucket. The bucket is already full. You know, and, and it's to really feel that. So to me, we, it's really wild to rest in that, to rest in a sense of our inherent virtue, our inherent goodness. It doesn't mean being arrogant or superior. It just means I'm not, I'm not always running behind others. It's not like you're always dealing with a backlog. You've got to somehow, you know, um, compensate for. It's that you're already okay. Right? It's to rest in that. And that's a matter of repetition, typically, and practice, you know, where we, we help ourselves rest in some good thing, even while over here the shame is flying around, or the guilt is flying around, or those old habit patterns of trying to, you know, be good enough for others, or to placate others, or prove oneself to others, et cetera, et cetera. That might be flying around, but deep down inside, we're already feeling our own kind of worth. It's really wild. I mean, I, I know we're going to finish in just a moment here. To imagine for everyone, what would it be? What would your year be like if you moved through it f feeling already worthy, already enough? You know, from that already enoughness, sure, manifest more improve your game a little more, get a little more skillful about this, so forth. But already so I know, worthy. Mm -hmm. and then we're I know that my, mm -hmm. we talk about the subconscious mind that exists inside the body, right? Yeah. So what I hear from you is as you wanted to change that baseline of my baseline, for example, is gift and shell if I receive from somebody, and it's completely okay if I give, and they shouldn't have to feel guilt and shame when they receive, right? Yeah, because you're special. I, That's, as yeah. we say, negative <laughs> grandiosity. <laughs> right. So what I hear from you is in order for me or anybody else to change yeah. that baseline yeah. is yeah. to take that goodness of the feeling. So whatever you wanted to improve in yourself. And even if it's just you feel it 1% or 10%, what you're saying is if you stay with that feeling and nourish that, that you will gradually change that baseline. Did I hear it correctly? Yes, that's a great summary of the fundamental process of social-emotional learning, which is what you and I do for a living, right? Or as I put it, taking in the good or the, the movement from state to trait. So you start by helping yourself have even quick and mild experiences of the kind of thing I'm saying to, you know, that you actually believe that it's okay and fair, you know, to receive or that you feel goodness. You start there and then you slow down. For me, the big three are try to stay with it for a breath or longer, feel it in your body and focus on what's enjoyable about it. Neurologically, those are all factors of learning broadly, so somatic learning, emotional learning, social learning, and again and again and again. And honestly, the, the bigger the challenge, the more repetition we need, right? So coming from the culture you've come from, the background, the, the influences around you, you know, there's a lot, it's, 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 a, it's a deep habit, right? The habit of shame, let's say, at receiving, call it that. If the bigger the habit, the more that it's been reinforced by history, the more it's being reinforced, maybe in subtle, even well-intended ways by the people in our lives, the more we need to repeatedly take in the good of the sense of the other way we want to be. We're trying to help ourselves become different. We're trying, in little ways, you know, we're trying to establish in ourselves. We're trying to plant certain flowers in ourselves, as it were, in the garden of our own mind. It, you know, 
the more that there are weeds there, <laughs> you know, the weeds of feeling inadequate, you know, and guilt, say, blah, blah, uh, gender socialization, cultural socialization going way back, right? The deeper all that is, right, the more weeds there are, the more um, uh, effort we need to make as gardeners. <laughs> Again and again and again, but it's a good job. It's a sweet work to keep, you know, feel it, internalize it, feel it, internalize it, feel it, internalize it many, many times a day, 10 seconds at a time, maybe longer sometimes, but many times a day. So what I heard from you also is if there is a lot of weeds that you have to pull it out, you have to be more patient with yourself. Yeah, and and two things. I mean, again, as a therapist, there's a place for pulling the weeds, right? There's a place for, you know, cognitive methods where you argue against the beliefs, the voices, you know, that tell you you don't deserve to receive. Okay, there's a place for that. But often it's really helpful to focus on planting flowers, especially in the for a while. And then after a while, you can use the flowers to literally clear out the weeds. But it's kind of useful to plant those flowers. And um, to finish here for everyone, you could, you know, so I was only able to talk with one person. I'll, I'll be back next week. I'll be back next week. <laughs> you know, same time, same station, same microphone. Anyway, come to the show. Come back to the club. Uh, we'll finish here. But and I'll maybe I'll do another person next week. Okay, for sure. I got that. So I apologize to the folks. I'm not able to get here. And I see you in, in the screen. I did. But next week, let's try. But the point is, just to finish here, Whatever it is that you want to be more in, in, in terms of being, qualities of being, okay? We stabilize, we establish these ways of being by repeatedly experiencing them or factors of them or just tastes of them. That we help to hardwire into our body and nervous system. We help them to sink in, to be internalized, to be installed in our very being. Again and again, you know, um, experiencing, learning, experiencing, learning, experiencing, internalizing, experiencing, internalizing, again and again and again. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. And one of the ways into that is to locate that quality as it is already present in yourself. That's one way. Other ways are to do things or to interact with other people or to take on little practices that naturally bring you into that kind of way of being that's like your growing edge. You know, it's the, it's not established. It, it's not fully stabilized, but you can kind of get in touch with it. You can, get a, you can contact it. And then when you do, really help your brain take it in again and again and again. What that might be, maybe it's about being a little calmer or a little quicker, more like uh, the duck whose water runs off when other people are aggravating, you know, a little more rested in a feeling of like, what a good, like lately, honestly, just recently, I mean, I'm, I'm 68, I'm old. And I just recently got in touch with, um, honestly, what a good boy I was, what a good boy I am. Oh, it was so endearing. And like this little sense of, I was called Ricky. Uh, you know, Ricky is this eight-year-old sweet kid who just really wanted to explore and enjoy, didn't want to hurt anybody, wanted to, you know, kind of be out and free and not under the thumb, you know, of other people, parents included. Oh, what a sweet, good kid that was. Yeah, you know, and you get in touch with that. And when you get in touch with that, High value, slow it down. Let that way of being establish itself in you increasingly. And I really want to okay. enjoy and appreciate uh, that small Rick, that because of him, we are all enjoying you. Uh, that's very kind. Thank you very much. It's true. Well, let's just sit quietly if we could, just for a minute or so, and then if you those, then we'll wave goodbye. And those who are still here in a few minutes, I went really long tonight, so I acknowledge that. But I, I I'll be usually I'm better at ending close to seven thirty. Okay, and then those who want can stick around. And if you do stick around uh, into the breakout rooms, you know, I uh, two questions might be: What's one 
quality of being that you would like to, you know, live from more, protect, you know, establish more in yourself as your ground of being? And then second, uh, what would be helpful to you in uh, helping that land in you more and establish itself and to, to occupy you, right? Two questions if you want to stick around for the breakout groups. All right, let's just sit. I'll sit with you and whatever you find helpful tonight, just kind of let it land. And thank you, Farah. That was really great. Very courageous on your part. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Including just simply resting in the sense of being, not being any particular quality, just being. Just presence in the present, just being as a kind of space through which experiences flow, a space in which doing naturally unfolds, in which there are things to have and not have. Uh, resting in being, spacious, spaciously being. And may you be well, may all beings be well, now and always, and certainly in the new year. <laughs>